In a year of momentous happenings, the year 2000 was a time of new political regimes, efforts for peace, and an aircraft disaster. Millennium celebrations had ushered in the new year, but it wasn't long before it was back to business as usual. In Northern Ireland, Secretary Peter Mandelson suggested that there was good reason to be optimistic about the statement from the IRA that it would, to use its words, put its weapons beyond use. He called it a very significant development. The coroner leading the inquest into the Omar bombing said the real IRA were entirely to blame for the blast. He dismissed claims by the real IRA that the police were to blame for the way they handled it. A memorial service was held for the 29 victims who died in the blast. The coroner said the four weeks of harrowing evidence had been an emotional experience he would never forget. In France, a tyre blowout could have been to blame for triggering a chain of events that led to the July Concorde plane crash outside Paris, which resulted in the loss of 114 lives. Air France Flight 4590 caught fire on takeoff from Charles de Gaulle Airport and shortly after crashed into the nearby Hotelissimo Le Relais Bleu Hotel. Former KGB agent Vladimir Putin swept a victory in Russia's presidential election in March and swiftly began considering government changes and working on an economic program for his impoverished country. But questions were to remain about the direction Putin would take the world's largest country and second biggest nuclear power. In August, the by now beleaguered president, Vladimir Putin, ordered a day of mourning to be held for the 118 sailors who died in the submarine Kursk as a shocked and angry nation tried to come to terms with the tragedy. For over one week, Russia had hoped and prayed that the sailors trapped at the bottom of the Barents Sea in the nuclear-powered submarine would be rescued alive. Russian authorities faced an unprecedented barrage of criticism at home and abroad for not disclosing full facts about the tragedy and being too slow in requesting foreign aid. The Russian press was also highly critical of the government's handling of the crisis and directed much of its fire at President Vladimir Putin, who had formerly enjoyed impressive approval ratings. Across the Atlantic, George W. Bush appeared to win the U.S. presidential election, but Democrat Al Gore retracted his concession after the result of the pivotal state of Florida narrowed to a few hundred votes. The astonishing twist of an extraordinary night came after Bush, the governor of Texas, seemed to have the 270 electoral college votes he needed to win the presidency. With his family gathered around him in an upstairs living room of the Texas governor's mansion, Bush told reporters he would not concede Florida. Ralph Nader, a third-party candidate celebrated in Washington, D.C., had been hoping for more of a victory on principle. Uh, trying to challenge the entrenched two-party system. This is really a lot what the campaign was about. Uh, the two parties uh, rigged the statutory barriers to get on the ballot, for starters, and they command most of the money by raising corrupt soft money and corporate money and... Uh, PAC money, all of which we rejected, all of which we rejected because we wanted to set an example uh, of what is necessary for real reform of our corrupt uh, campaign finance system. On a generally miserable night, Mrs. Hillary Clinton gave Democrats something to cheer, making history by winning a seat to represent New York in the Senate. With her husband standing behind her on stage, Hillary Clinton expressed her gratitude to the people of New York. Thank you for opening up your minds and your hearts, for seeing the possibility of what we could do together for our children and for our future here in this state and in our nation. I am profoundly grateful to all of you for giving me the chance to serve you. In October, thousands of people in Belgrade celebrated the demise of former Yugoslav President Slobodan Milosevic. 2000, a year of politics, peace and tragedy, was truly a year of momentous happenings. In a year of momentous happenings, 2001 was a year that saw events that put the US presidency to test and, according to some, changed the world forever. Early in the year, after insisting that the economy of a superpower must come first, United States President George W. Bush came under pressure from European leaders who insisted he honor a 1997 treaty to combat global warming. 
In a new diplomatic initiative, the European Union said it was sending a mission to Russia, China, Iran and Japan, where the treaty was signed in the city of Kyoto, to gauge support for the pact after Bush's rejection of it. A few months later, a damning report from the International Federation of the Red Cross and the Red Crescent Societies said that global warming was helping to increase not only the number of natural disasters each year, but also the severity of them, and it was the poor who were suffering the most. I think the first thing, you've got to make it clear to people what's actually happening. Um, for me, there are really two things going on at the moment. There is an increase in the number of disasters, and that's almost certainly due to global warming and changes in climate patterns. And there's an increase in their severity. More and more people are, if you like, being pushed into poverty and just unable to climb back out of that. And some of that is to do with the process of globalization and how it impacts on people's lives. So you've got to get the story straight to start with. And then you've got to look at the solutions. And the solutions are basically to say disasters, they're not a blip on the development curve. They're absolute part of development now, and you've got to deal with them like that. They're not one-off events. In New York, the city skyline, a powerful symbol of America's financial heart, was about to become the center of a tragic event that stunned the world. In less than two hours on September the 11th, almost 3,000 people were killed, hundreds injured, and the iconic Twin Towers of the World Trade Center lay in ruins. Thomas Canavan was one of the lucky ones. He made it down from the 47th floor safely, but did not manage to get out of the building before being caught in the collapse. Uh, big boom, come down the steps, everything fine till we got to the basement and then everything just fell in. Uh, I got trapped in there with another guy, crawled out, kept getting hit in the head, hit bags all around, finally we clawed our way out over the rubble. Come on, did all right. All right, where'd be Tom? Let's go. In the days following the attack, Hundreds and hundreds of families were still waiting to hear whether or not the remains of their loved ones had been found. A lot of these people are never going to come home to us, but they need to rest somewhere, and they have to rest there, and it has to be done properly, with some respect. When the former Beatle George Harrison died later in the year, somehow it seemed that the days of peace and love were over for some. I mean, you can think back. The Beatles, when you listen to their music, it takes you back to a time where you actually can make believe it was actually very peaceful, even though it really was in the 60s. But they take you out of this world, especially with the attacks of September 11, what's going on all over Europe, daily attacks, terrorism, and things are just getting really worse. The 58-year-old lead guitarist of the Beatles, once a heavy smoker, had been treated three years earlier in Switzerland for throat cancer and had developed lung cancer earlier in the year. I found out last night and uh, I'm devastated, obviously, like everyone is. Um, he had a long battle with his cancer, um, but I saw him a few weeks ago and he was full of fun like he always was. He's uh, such a brave lad. To me, he's just my little baby brother. Uh, we grew up together and uh, I knew him in my old hometown, Liverpool. and. Um, we just had so many beautiful times together that that's what I'm going to uh, remember him by. A lovely guy who's full of humour, as I say, even when I saw him last time and he was uh, obviously very unwell. He was still cracking jokes like he always was and uh, he'd be sorely missed. He's a beautiful man and uh, the world will miss him. As US-led forces mounted devastating bombing raids on Afghanistan, 2001 was drawing to a close. Another year of momentous happenings. In a year of momentous happenings, 2002 was a year of disaster, war and hostage taking. In March, Operation Anaconda, the US-led battle to overthrow Taliban and Al-Qaeda forces in Afghanistan was declared officially over. The world's a safer place than it was on the 2nd of March when we inserted several thousand coalition forces including soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines that put their lives on the line to confront Al-Qaeda and Taliban terrorists. Hundreds of terrorists died. Unfortunately, 11 of our coalition warriors and heroes also died. The focus then shifted to a guerrilla war as small bands of fighters from Afghanistan's hardline Islamic Taliban movement and Saudi-born militant Osama bin Laden's Al-Qaeda network tried to evade the Allied forces. 
The German resort of Lake Constance was the scene of a massive disaster when 71 people, including 52 children, died after a Russian passenger plane travelling from Moscow to Barcelona collided with a cargo plane over this picture postcard region of southern Germany. There were no casualties on the ground, even though police said they found pieces of wreckage in 57 different places. Witnesses saw a fireball and debris was scattered over an area of about five square kilometres around Überlingen, a resort town of 20,000. The Russian children, who were mainly from the oil-rich region of Bashkortostan, some 1,500 kilometres east of Moscow, had been heading to Barcelona for a UNESCO festival. Airline officials said many of the passengers on the flight had the same surname, indicating families lost more than one relative. Russia was the scene of more momentous happenings of 2002 when security forces were deployed outside a theatre in Moscow where a self-titled Chechen suicide squad held hundreds of people hostage after killing one woman who tried to escape. The bold guerrilla attack in the Russian capital, carried out by up to 40 heavily armed men and women seeking a Russian troop withdrawal from their homeland, defied the world community and dealt a humiliating blow to the Kremlin. The guerrillas, armed with guns, grenades and explosives, held Russian security forces at bay by threatening to blow up the theatre and their 700 captives if an attempt was made to storm it. At dawn three days later, Russian special forces stormed the theatre and used gas to knock out the Chechen guerrillas. Up to 90 hostages died along with most of their rebel captors, though more than 750 people who had been held for the three days by the heavily armed Muslim guerrillas were rescued. In freezing rain, the hostages were ferried quickly out of the theatre, many to hospital and away from waiting journalists. The Muslim rebels, who had rigged up explosives throughout the building, had threatened to start killing their hostages early on Saturday if they did not see evidence their demands that Moscow's troops pull out of Chechnya were being met. Thirteen years after the fall of the Berlin Wall, the European Union executive said former communist East European states such as Poland and Hungary were ready to compete inside the EU's single market following long and painful economic and social reforms. In December, 10 European Union candidate countries received a green light to join the 15-nation bloc in 2004, paving the way for a historic unification of Europe. As Brazil headed into the finals against Germany in the World Cup, world-renowned psychic Yuri Geller made public his prediction of who was going to win the World Cup. Geller had buried two small rock crystals under the artificial lawn, which he said served as tools for him to predict the World Cup winners. He had spent about half an hour in the stadium before making his prediction outside in front of the stadium clock. He said that after spending enough time in the stadium and using the crystals as amplifiers, he knew which team would take the trophy home. My prediction is this. My third day here at the stadium, my two intuitive forces tell me that Brazil will win the World Cup. Brazil went on to win the tournament for a record fifth time beating Germany 2-0 in the final. 2002, another year of momentous happenings. 1999 was a year of momentous happenings with a devastating earthquake, fears of a millennium bug and a change of president for South Africa. A new era was dawning in South Africa when the country said goodbye to its first black president and welcomed its second. Dabo Mbeki was sworn in as president at the inauguration ceremony in Pretoria. That day also marked Nelson Mandela's retirement from political life. Meanwhile, in southeastern Europe, a human flood of refugees, caught in rain and cold on both sides of the border of the Serbian province of Kosovo, had overwhelmed relief efforts in what a NATO general called a humanitarian catastrophe. Tens of thousands of ethnic Albanians, desperate to flee Kosovo, were stranded at the border after Macedonia effectively closed its frontiers in April. The government ordered a partial military mobilization to beef up security in the area around Blache, where at least 40,000 ethnic Albanians were camped in rain-drenched fields with little food or water after fleeing the conflict between Serbian security forces and separatist ethnic Albanians in the southern Serbian province. Meanwhile, at the Macedonian-Yugoslav border, thousands of refugees camped out in the open air in the nearby fields stretching away from the border post. In nearby Bojani, 
NATO troops helped to erect one of the first refugee camps to shelter at least some of the estimated 70,000 ethnic Albanian refugees who had arrived in the country. The UNHCR estimated that about a quarter of a million ethnic Albanians had been driven from their homes. Across the Aegean Sea, the official death toll in the Turkish earthquake had reached over 17,000. Rescue workers continue to search for survivors from Turkey's worst earthquake in 60 years. The quake, the deadliest since December 1939, measured approximately 7.4 on the Richter scale. Angry residents accused the Turkish government and the military of not doing enough in the immediate aftermath of the quake. With more than 40,000 people injured and thousands more missing and buried under rubble, the toll was expected to rise further as rescue teams recovered more bodies than survivors from beneath the rubble. As each hour passed, hopes of finding more people alive beneath the tons of debris faded. The quake, which struck at three in the morning, was centered on the northwestern industrial city of Izmit some 90 kilometers east of Istanbul, Turkey's biggest city, which links Europe and Asia. Most of the dead were crushed in their sleep as the force of the earthquake destroyed apartment blocks across the Marmara Sea region, Turkey's most heavily populated area and its industrial heart. People began camping in the open as estimates of those made homeless by the earthquake rose to more than 100,000. As 1999 was drawing to a close, Asian countries were embracing the new millennium in different ways. Filipinos shrugged off fears over possible Y2K bug problems and geared up for street parties. Thailand officially opened its national Y2K command center. That we will be keep watching uh, our neighboring countries like New Zealand, Australia, Japan and, and, and Singapore, which they have the, uh, they will reach midnight ahead of us and we'll be observing how they perform and that will also help us how to correct ourselves uh, in Thailand. The Y2K, or Millennium Bug problem, was thought to relate to computers and computer systems whose date fields denote years by the last two digits, raising the prospect of computer crashes when 2000 began. In Hong Kong, authorities ensured safety at the Hong Kong International Airport, one of the busiest airports in Asia. More than 120 additional air traffic control officers were deployed at the airport on December the 31st to activate Y2K contingency measures. Up to 82 flights had been cancelled for New Year's Eve and 131 cancelled the next day. All this proved to be mostly a waste of time though, as end of the millennium revelers got into swing across the globe. From Antarctica to London, the festivities reached fever pitch as the clock ticked over into the 21st century. 1999, another year of momentous happenings.